presenter, Dr. Felix Weissner. Felix obtained his PhD in structural and fire engineering from the University of Edinburgh before joining UQ to research the interface between timber durability and fire performance. As a member of the National Centre for Timber Durability and Design Life, he works closely with the wood scientists to advance our knowledge about the resilience of timber in the context of fire safety. His research is driven by the combination of bench and large scale experiments and his career has been defined by the search for improved and simplified experimental techniques for fire safety. For his current position as lecturer in timber engineering, Felix is building a research group to investi investigate and optimise the effect of timber treatments and the targeted selection of native Australian wood species, both for decay resistance and fire retardancy on the design life of timber. Past research highlights include the assessment of structural stability of buildings after a fire has decayed and the determination of the influence of adhesive types on the load bearing capacity of structures in fire. Okay, I'd now like to hand over to you, Felix. So we are here live from the fire lab. So apologies if I wander about every now and then um, because we have a couple of screens and cameras. Um, hopefully someone will give me the pointer to the right one. Um, just now we have a quick introduction slides and then we're gonna show you some experiments what we do here at the University of Queensland to investigate the fire safety of timber. Um, you should see a slide. Anyone has any idea of who this is, this unfortunate person? So that's uh, Prometheus. And according to Greek mythology, he's the one who stole fire from the gods to give it to humankind. And as a punishment, he was chained to a rock for an eagle to eat his liver every day and then it regrows and then gets eaten again and so forth. So pretty severe punishment um, for what seems to be a noble gesture. And this sort of Greek mythology, um, you can also find it in similar forms in other cultures, for example, in Native um, American cultures, um, or some of them at least, the uh, fire was given by either the possum or the spider to humans from the gods. The fire is as a privilege or a gift from God. And that really highlights how important it is for, for us as humans, um, both in the past and in the present. Um, it gives us uh, warm, light. Uh, we, we use it for cooking, uh, propulsion. It has been used in warfare. Um, even today, when, when you turn on your car, uh, the combustion engine in that drives your car is essentially fire or combustion on a very, very refined space. Um, and on the other hand, of this of the seminars of we have the fire site and on the other hand um Kai, can you go to the next slide please uh we have we have timber again something that's very very closely linked to our development as humans uh, we use it in a lot of forms we build our houses i.e shelter we use it for tools um, again we use it for land management you can build bridges from it um, if you walk around in your city wherever you are you're likely to find uh, some electricity or tell the communication poles made of timber, so that's infrastructure. Um, then wood, which is what, what timber is made of, um, is used recreationally. Um, most people will have some forest in their countries and nearby, um, which is an important source um, recreationally, also economically an important source for local communities. Um, yeah, so, and also timber can be used as fuel. And this is really where we come to the point of our seminar, because when you build your houses from your fuel, you can run into problems. And I think with that, we can go live to the, to the fire lab now. Uh, no, back one slide. That's better. Yeah, so you should see me now in the fire lab. So the title of this webinar is uh, Fire Safety of Timber, a 21st Century Material. Um, which is a bit misleading because timber is not only a 21st century material, we have been using it for a long, long time. Um, we have been using it to build our buildings basically since we've started constructing buildings. Um, it didn't always go well in terms of fire safety, especially if you look at the past, you'll find a lot of history on the Great Fire of London, the Great Fire of Boston, the Great Fire of Chicago. You have a Great Fire of Brisbane, you had a uh, the Great Mariki Fire, which was then called Edo, which is present-day Tokyo. Basically, every country and 
most major cities will have in the past experienced uh, a fire um, which destroyed large parts of the city, which was driven by uh, a lack of fire safety and the fact that a lot of buildings back then were built from timber that wasn't very protected or not constructed with a with a fear of fire safety. And really, in the in the 20th century, those mass conflagrations, at least in major cities in the developed world, um, have really gone down. Like now, we still have a lot of fires, but they usually are contained to one or two buildings, um, which is really in reflecting in how we've changed in terms of architecture. But also now we 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 hide the timber behind plasterboard, or we use concrete or steel, and that means um, you're basically limited from fire. So, but now in the 21st century, one thing has changed is we have now these products. Uh, this is a cross laminated timber, and it's part of a family of engineered timber products. So basically, what's happening is here we have a board that is uh, with the grain direction parallel. And then the next board has the crane direction crosswise to that, and they're glued together. And then you have another one and another one and so on. And you can combine them to create this very big, solid piece of timber. And I mean, this is just a small piece that we cut out in, in real construction projects. These are fabricated to nine by four meters or similar, and can then be used um, either as floor slabs or walls. And if you get a bunch of them, you can basically just put your, you get them all on your site and you just put your building together. So that has really driven a renewed interest in timber for larger buildings. I mean, this goes to a Queensland audience now, but uh, most people will know that the Queenslanders are mostly uh, timber buildings. Um, but now with, with this material, we're really looking for like multi-story timber buildings with, with bigger, bigger spaces um, and also going higher. And with that also come fire safety challenges because if you have a taller building or a larger building, uh, the fire service has special requirements because they might have to go in or they need to be able to extinguish it. So if you go above a certain height, you have the possibility that the, the fire service might not even reach the fire with their hoses. So then what we need to do for the fire to do is burn out on its own without spreading to the next compartment or the next building. Um, so now we're using this in bigger buildings. And also because it's used more and it, it's attracting the attention from architects, they want to showcase it because timber, I mean, this is a bit of a grimy piece that we have in the lab here, but uh, timber in the built environment can look really, really nice and architects like that. And it has also been shown that it calms people more to sit in a timber built environment where they can see the timber um, compared to, for example, a concrete building. And another big driver is that if you use timber, the idea is you, you have a tree, you chop the tree, you turn it into something like this, you put that in your building, the building lasts 50 years, maybe longer, hopefully longer. In that time, the tree can regrow, store carbon. So now you have the carbon stored in two ways. And that way, um, using timber can really help to reduce the carbon footprint of buildings. Um, which is something we seriously need to consider if we want to meet climate uh, global warming targets, um, not the carbon targets for global warming, but to reduce it. Um, so one reason why this material is being touted for tall timber is that because it's quite thick, it burns differently to, to the sort of uh, stick construction that uh, timber frame buildings of the past have used or that are still being used, but are behind plasterboard or, or other, other um, fire resistant materials. And one, the, the thing that, so if you have a, if you look at a campfire and you have two big logs burning, if you take them out, they won't burn by themselves. And anyone who has ever made a campfire will also notice uh, how difficult it is to actually get it going if you only have big pieces. So that's because timber has a relatively low conductivity. And the thing is when you heat it at the, at the, at the surface, the surface heats up, but a lot of the energy is just lost in, in uh, pyrolyzing it and um, energy is transmitted to the, to the interior of the timber, but it's not contributing flammable gases. And we can actually show that. So please bear with us as we go to our little fire safety setup. So here we have a propane burner. which produces a flame. And I can essentially 
hold it on a timber and you can see a bit of flaming, but it's really hard to ignite the timber to sustain the ignition. But if I take it away, this is what happens. So even with this flame, I mean, it's, I'm not sure if it comes across in the video, but it's a blue flame, which usually means it's, it's very well mixed, which indicates it's very hot. Um, it's hard to ignite that timber. Um, you can see it, it's charred, but it doesn't, there's no sustained fire. So this is what a lot of timber companies and also proponents of timber will show you. And it is a nice thought experiment because it illustrates how difficult it is to ignite timber. The problem though is that in a building, the issue isn't ignition. Ignition in your building fire is done by, I don't know, maybe your tumble dryer is defect or you, you, you bought a, your phone charger is broken, so your phone overheats and that sets something on fire. And then you have a small fire and that maybe sets your curtain on fire and then your, your, your sofa or your couch starts burning. And then that heat accumulates in a compartment, i.e. in your room. And then you get heat fluxes that are much more than this little flame. And then the problem is if you have timber everywhere, which will just, we'll, we'll simulate a real fire with this device, which is a h -trist. And it's basically a couple of radiant panels that are gas powered and we're gonna ignite them. And with that, we can simulate heat fluxes that are very close to what you see in a real fire once, once your couch and your sofa starts burning. And then we'll see what that piece of timber does in reaction to that. And then you should imagine if, you, if you're in a full building and you don't only have a small piece, but a whole wall or a whole wall and a whole ceiling of exposed timber. But we're just gonna start this experiment now. Uh, it might get a bit loud. I have to turn on our experimental setup. So one thing we can do with um, this machine is, as you can see, it's on tracks. So we can move it backwards and forwards. And that way we can, we can simulate the, a fire in a room because when we move it very close, that's representative of a full fire. But if we move it backwards, that's representative of the state when all the, when all the, all the fuel has burned out. You can see we are turning the, these on now. And right now, the, the, you can see some blue flames um, next to on the radiant panels. And you can see them heating up. And that causes radiation to go onto our timber piece. So at the moment, we're actually quite far away from, the, from our sample. I need to restart the computer here because it went into screensaver. So at the moment, the, the heat flux that we can calibrate with, with separate experiments that are on seven kilowatts per meter squared. So that's not even a, enough to ignite timber. But as we heat up these panels and when we move them closer, we'll see that the timber will start to burn. So if we go to, let's say, 25 kilowatts per meter squared, You, know, you will now soon, hopefully, start to see the timber changing color as it's affected by radiant heat. Okay. We can see some discoloration on the timber. So that means uh, the heat is breaking down the timber into pyrolysis gases. And I'm not sure if it's visible on the video, but there's also smoke being emitted now from the timber. So it once you get the right mixture of those pyrolysis and heat and air, then the timber would burn. So if we go a bit closer,
So now we're at uh, 55 kilowatts per meter squared. And without an external spark, we can see the timber ignited. And that's going to keep burning now. Because as long as we have the feedback from, the, from our room fire, there will be enough energy to keep that timber burning. If we reduce the fire again, so if you imagine you have your room, you have your couch, you have your sofa, um, all that is on fire, that's what we refer to as the movable fuel load. But eventually that movable fuel load is going to burn out, no? Um, I mean, it's a, it's a finite fuel source. So we could simulate that by reducing our heat flux again. So And now if you look at the sample, you will see the flames reduce. And eventually what happens is it self extinguishes. And if we look at the sample from the side, we can see very distinctively that a char layer has built up. And that char is basically the solid residue of burnt timber. And what it does is once it's burned, it doesn't have any structural capacity anymore, but it, it protects the timber underneath by preventing flow of gases and also by reducing the heat flux that the timber underneath sees. Um, of course, now if we, it doesn't mean, I mean, people like to, some people like to say that char is, has some sort of magic property. But if we go forward again, so if we add heat flux again, we'll, we'll, we'll get flaming again eventually as we form new powerless gases from underneath the timber. And we could do this for a while now. Eventually, once the char front fills up thick enough, you need more heat flux to, to actually burn the timber. So in an ideal fire scenario, so we could do this all day now, but I think we, we've made a point. And I'm going to shut off the gas now, which will turn off the panels. And we can see the timber, there's some residual flaming on the corners, which is just where you still have fresh timber. Obviously, in a real building, you wouldn't have those edges because you would look at a wall or, or a ceiling, which is contained in itself. And now the timber has self-extinguished. And I mean, it's still pretty hot here from the radiation but I can go on the back of the timber and touch that with no problem. I couldn't do that with a piece of steel because steel has high, it's very highly conductive. But with timber, if, if this was a wall and I was standing here, I could face the fire and nothing would happen to me. So that's the idea behind compartmentation. Um, I think we can probably step away from this now. We actually have a piece of timber here from a experiment before. And again, you can see the char layer on the one side. So from one side, that exposure. And really, the other side is pretty intact. If you think here, that's, that is basically virgin timber. Um, so I'm not sure it was pretty loud. I hope everyone could hear what I was saying. So basically, what we illustrated there was um, how a fire can vary. So you get your ignition, everything starts burning. And then the problem is if you have a lot of timber that contributes to your fuel load in your, in your building, in your room. But if you manage to go to the situation where you burn out all the movable fuel load and only the timber remains, um, you can get the heat flux low enough for the timber to self-extinguish is what we showed. So there's a couple of ways how the strategy can go wrong. Um, one way is if you have too much exposed timber, then the timber will feed back onto itself or onto the other timber surfaces and we'll just keep burning and burning. And then you need the fire service. And like we said earlier, we might be in a situation where we have a fire safety strategy where we cannot rely on the fire service to reach the fire. So in that case, our fire strategy has failed. The, the other issue that can happen is, um, if we go back to the slides, um, we could have shown it with this sample, but it would take a while because you basically need to burn uh, through these, the lamellas of the timber. I'm just going to grab a random piece here. So as you've seen earlier, these are different lamellas of timber that are glued together. You can see it in the slides now. There's an experiment 
we ground the lock um, a wee while ago. Uh, yeah, and eventually what you see is the, the lamella falls out and that causes um, fresh timber to be exposed to the heat. Because you could see there weren't many flames before that happened. Um, not sure if we can restart the slide to just go back and go forth to show that again. Uh, oh yeah, it just keeps running that one, but can you go to the previous slide please and then the next one again? Yeah, so here we have, we see the front is intact. There aren't that many flames, it's burning, but it's at the, at the point where if we were to remove the heat source, which you can see in the left of the, of the, of the, of the video, then it would go out. But then what happens is a piece of the, the clue, uh, the clued lamella falls off and provides timber that's, that's not completely charred yet and that provides new fuel and eventually that falls off and then you can see the flames coming from the gap that it leaves and if that keeps happening in your compartment fire then again you have a situation where you don't get self-extinguishment so that's one of the other challenges we face um, and these are the things we are researching um, and on the next slide we actually see that sort of this is what we call char fall off and for example, on the left, this is a large scale experiment that we ran a couple of years ago. And you can see there's like a bit of residue of, of burning material in our compartment. Um, but other than that, there aren't many flames. But you can see somewhere near the wall, there's a bit peeling off and you get fresh flames there. And the same in the other picture, you can see this localized. There's, I mean, in this case, you can see like a whole board um, sort of coming off and underneath flames popping up and then that happens it has the potential to reignite all of the other timber and basically what you get you get a you get a growing fire a decaying fire a growing fire a decaying fire and you never get to where you want which is a fire that extinguishes itself uh, so that's a big issue that we are researching we're researching ways to to deal with that um, there's a couple of things you can do you can work on your adhesive try to make that last longer in a fire um, I think in terms of the slides, Kyle, can you switch back to me in the lab? Oh, no, actually, there's more. Yeah. Um, so can we go back to the slides? Thanks. Uh, the ones after the two pictures. Yeah, this is just what I talked about before. So here we see temperatures inside a compartment fire, and we can see them going up as the fire burns, and then they go down the temperature. So this is what we want to see. This is what I said when I said self-extinguishment, they go to like a couple of hundred degrees, which when we talk in terms of fire safety, isn't much and they're decaying further. Um, nice small bubbles that are blue. This is what we want to see. And then in the next slide, um, we have the same thing, but this time with the lamination happening. Again, we get the fire that starts, it grows. And then you'll see for now the fire goes down. But now what happens is because you get the lamination, the temperatures increase again. So this is what I talked about earlier, saying you have this, this cyclic fire that won't go out, which is what we need. And that's something, if we had, for example, if we have a compartment that's completely built of concrete, which doesn't burn, um, then that's not an issue. But then again, we can't keep building all of our buildings out of concrete because of the, the issue with the carbon footprint. And also we want to have some nice materials and. Uh, we want to work with timber. I'm not saying we cannot use concrete at all. I'm not saying we can use only timber, but we have to find a nice balance. And the research we're doing in here is, is looking at what are the issues and how do we address them. So I think that should be the last of the slides. Yeah, uh, but we have some more things to show you in the lab. So basically, yeah, one thing you can do um, to try to prevent the, the delamination or the char fall off is if you use thicker outer layers because that means your fire front reaches the, the your glue line later and this way you can push your delamination later. Obviously that also has consequences for the for other aspects of building design because thick outer layers are not always easy to find. If you think about it, you want, a, you want to find a board with re relatively little defects, so knots and veins that are in the timber. And the thicker you need your board to be, the harder it gets to find that from a tree. So working from that, um, you have to find compromises. Another thing you can change is the adhesive. And obviously you also want to know 
how much fuel can you get in a compartment before you get to the to the fall off issue and all these things we we can explore here in our file lab um, on a lab scale so for example the experiment you just saw was a, a small to medium scale lab scale um, we can investigate the material on the on the micro and macro scale um, we also cooperate with the Queensland Fire and Emergency Services. Uh, they have a live fire campus where we build large scale experiments, where we basically we get a couple of pieces of cross laminated timber, screw them together um, in a configuration that we want to investigate, put some fuel in, into it, start burning, and then we see if burnout happens or if char fall off um, fails our fire strategy, or if there's maybe too much timber exposed. Um, so all of that is research that's going on here um, within our research group. And another thing I wanted to show you was, so this was all the, the fun part, the burning, but actually running a fire experiment, uh, there's much more to it than just setting, than just taking a torch and setting fire to things. Um, you've already seen with the h so basically the radiant panels on the, on the, on the rails, um, that we can control the heat flux, but getting there takes a while because we have to calibrate the heat flux we have to come up with the experiment and it's one thing where we really want to control the the environment that we're in and one thing with fire safety experiments is you want part of your structure that you're investigating to get very very hot but ideally everything else has to remain quite cool and one thing that we're trying to do with uh, fire safety experiments is let me just go over here and see if we have These are our connectors. I'll just go grab a thermocouple. So, not sure if that's very visible, but it's, this one is half a millimeter. Um, so it's, it's these very fine probes, which are basically just two disillumer metals. And what we want to do is we want to get them in the timber. And from that, we can measure the internal solid temperature. And then knowing that really helps us to predict how long will the timber stay standing. Because remember, we, if we talk about large timber elements, they're going to carry the load of the building. Um, so as it burns, it weakens. Um, we need to know when that will happen and also the internal temperature gradient can tell us something about the internal heat flux which we then can then use to help to predict will self-extinguishment happen yes or no so um, then other than just showing you burning things which are always nice and interesting um, we have a drill rig in here okay, I need to grab my laptop for that So this is basically a converted CNC machine that we fitted with a drill. And I'm not sure how familiar people are with the movie Armageddon from 1998, before Michael Bay started doing questionable movies. Uh, great movie in my opinion, but I know that's taste. But there's this uh, cutout scene where Ben Affleck uh, brags how he was a bit of a smart ass and asked Michael Bay, oh, why is it easier to teach drillers to be astronauts than to teach astronauts how to drill a hole. And having drilled a lot of holes into timber for my PhD, I can tell you drilling is an art. There's a lot of things you have to consider. And this is basically uh, something we came up with because if you were like, again, if you think about these timber pieces in like the large scale, think three by three meters is what we use in our large scale experiments. And then you have to drill hundred or two hundred small holes into each of these pieces somewhere on site. You don't want to do that by hand because drilling a very small hole that fits the thermocouple straight into timber is very difficult um, without deviating from your path, without breaking the drill bit. Um, you want to have the right dimension. So what we have here is we connect our CNC machine and we can tell it the path to take. But this is just a quick demonstration. 
checking if everything works. So basically with that CNC machine, we can predefine all the holes we want. We can tell drill 50 millimeter deep at coordinate X 10 and Y 50. And then we just type all that in, press start. And then the, the drill robot uh, will do that work for us, which is really helpful on site because it saves us time um, and it allows us to work more precisely. And also one thing that it does well is we don't have to set out every hole. We just have to start, we just have to give it a start position and then it goes from that. So, I mean, I imagine in, in some other industries that are not fire safety, people probably have found better ways of doing that, but this is kind of a, our, um, I mean, it's not so cheap, but it's a cheap and dirty alternative to work on site and do these things and, and drill these holes into timber. And it's just a little example of all the background things that go into research in fire safety or in timber in general. Um, so it's a bit more for like how the sausage is made approach. Um, yeah, you can see it. I just put in some, some random coordinates now and some depths down to 20 millimeters. And actually, if I find one of those drill bits, so when I said you have to consider a lot of things, so if you, if you think about, so this drill has a diameter of 1.5 millimeters, which is the diameter of most of the thermocouples we use. But then if you have a 120 mil deep pole, that's 1.5 millimeter, and you're trying to, to press down a 1.5 millimeter thermocouple, you're gonna have a bad time because eventually the friction at the walls is going to make it impossible to push it any further. So what we what we did is we we custom ordered these. I'm not sure if that's visible. These are steps, so that they, they have several thicknesses that we use, and that way we can create a hole that has different diameters. So the bottom diameter is just the 1.5 mil, and then it extends to two, and then later to four. So we can easily insert a thermocouple, but we still get a tight fit at the tip, which is where a thermocouple measures. Um, the temperature. Um, the problem with these is they're quite expensive, so we always need to be a bit careful because that's one of the disadvantages of working with a robot. If something happens to the drill bit, it doesn't always recognize it, so it will keep pushing down and then you break them, um, which is not very good, but so far so good. And then you can take that out. And this way, I mean, there's no real pattern to this. I just picked some random coordinates, but we can also define how we want to lay them out. Um, usually we go for a circular arrangement around a zero coordinate, and that way we can define the packing density and define a minimum spacing for a thermocouple. Um, then some other work in terms of timbers or So I said earlier, you can change your, your, the thickness of your timber, you can change the adhesive. Another thing that some, some people say could work is changing, the, changing your timber species. In Australia alone, we have over 500 different timber species. Not all of them can be used commercially, but some can. And some of the research we're doing here is we look at different species. So for example, looking here at this table, we have a gray iron bark. And then here we have some burnt cooked down iron wood. Um, and here we have a small piece cooked downward. So this is before and this is after we burn. And for example, if we compare, so these were exposed to the same heat flux, the cooked down ironwood to this Queensland maple here, um, we'll see that the charring pattern is very different. The Queensland maple forms more ash on top um, and also the sizes are different. And then for example, what we have here is uh, the gray iron bark. So again, before or after. Um, and despite gray iron bark and cooked down ironwood having similar densities, um, the charring pattern, you can see that the size of the, these little cracks in the char are very different between the species, indicating that the burning behavior is different. And that also translates into fire safety. So here, these two boards were exposed to the same uh, heat flux. And then we ignite it at one end, and we see how far does the flame travel. And we can see on the cooked on ironwood from the char pattern, we get extinguishing earlier than what we get for the Queensland maple. So again, using timber species um, is one thing we investigate here for fire safety. Uh, not all timber species can be used for these engineered timber products because the cooked down ironwood, which we have here and here, 
it's just it's so dense that it would be very difficult to glue them together into into like one fixed piece so that's more something you would use as, as timber decking so that's where our research helps to identify suitable native timber species that can be used for for use in areas where you might get a bushfire but not a very severe bushfire so as long as you're far enough from the actual fire source um, you can use certain timber species in bushfire and we're exploring which ones and and what are the underlying factors in that in that timber species that make it better for bushfire use than others and i think uh, that's pretty much it um, but we now have a q and a so if you have any questions uh, feel free to go i hope this was all relatively coherent um, of course we would prefer to do this all in person but right now these webinars is what we have and i think so far they have been great so thank you to our engagement team we have a couple of people that work behind the camera to make this possible and yeah hopefully see you in the next year for more exciting webinars or even in-person um, engagement events i'm not sure what the plan is for that yet but we'll see um, can't make any promises but yeah get the q a going please well, thank you very much, Felix. That was fantastic. And um, it's always great to see an academic in their native environment. So hopefully those uh, watching who are perhaps less familiar with our day to day uh, have found some interesting insight into how the sausage is made, as you said. Um, but we do have some great questions coming through here because of, you touched on a, a massive amount of topics, which, which are obviously of high interest. Um, I'm just going to start with some in no particular order, but I guess um, you, you spoke a little bit about glues and chemicals um, but a question's come through here is what is their contribution to pyrolysis gases and smoke toxicity uh, i mean it's a field i personally haven't worked in a lot but i would say because the glue line if you look at so this piece of timber here is is maybe 140 mil or something like that and the glue line is really it's less than a millimeter of that so the, the glue in the timber doesn't contribute much to the actual mass that's there so in the fire as a whole what you get is mostly timber i wouldn't so in a fire generally the fire safety strategy that we do is that we um, try to keep all occupants away from any smoke as they and exit the building um, so the toxicity is not a primary concern in that sense um, but obviously firefighters like to not go into buildings that are burning with very toxic substances. But I would say compared to some plastics, engineered timber is still good. But it does pose a problem that it's trickier to dispose of them. Or for example, when you think of recycling, let's say a timber building comes to the end of its lifespan. Um, can you burn it without an adhesive in there? Um, you should probably be not use it for a campfire or your stove but you can still use it for energy somewhere. But in terms of a building fire, I'm not too concerned about the toxicity um, contribution from the adhesive itself, simply because it's just such a thin layer of mass compared to the overall flammability of the timber, uh, or to the overall gases coming from the timber. Oh, thank you. So uh, continuing on uh, about adhesives here, there's quite a lot of interest actually on the Q&A about it. So um, you gave us quite an excellent demonstration there of of why the adhesive layer is kind of of key interest to a fire safety strategy. Um, what research, and you touched briefly on research into adhesives themselves that perhaps perform better under thermal loadings. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about uh, what research has been conducted in terms of adhesives and delamination or under fire uh, loads? Yeah, so I mean, I know there's, there's been a, a bunch of tests um, for a couple of years now trying to find a good adhesive and so there's there's engineers and fire safety researchers that are interested in that from a timber point of view um but also if you go back there has there has always been an acknowledgement that different adhesives perform differently in in a fire safety situation but until the the emergence of that char fall of phenomenon for cross laminated timber it was never seen as a major problem because um, if you just have a column of timber but not a whole wall the contribution to the fire from that is not as big. So even if you have pieces falling out, it's not a bigger problem, not that big a problem. Um, one thing, so my own research in the past for my PhD was 
um, on the structural behavior of two different adhesive types. And I found that independent of char fall off, so long before you get the, 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 the char actually falling off, you see a structural difference between two adhesive types. So in my case, for my PhD, that was a one component polyurethane and a melamine urea formaldehyde. And you could see that um, for the polyurethane, you saw larger deflections early on in the fire leading to earlier failure, even if there was no char fall off, which tells us that there's something, if you heat up the timber, that at some point there's some sort of discontinuity happening here. Um, and obviously, if you imagine there's some load on that, then this section might very well carry shear, which means that between the layers, you could get a bit of slip. And that's a precursor to that, what can then develop into char fall off. Um, so these phenomena are not the same. So one thing we call the bonding is when you lose the interaction between the layers. The other one is delamination or char fall off, um, which is when actually the whole piece of char falls off. But um, I know there have been some studies also in the US on like full scale compartments. Um, studies are going on from our PhD students and master students. Um, I know universities in Europe, so in, in Edinburgh and in Zurich, uh, all are looking into the char fall off. So one thing is how do we detect it? Another thing is how do we prevent it? So which adhesives work better? And it's obviously also a trade-off because some adhesives might be better at fire, um, but on the other hand, there might have, there might be more toxic, not in fire, but some adhesives um, off gas formaldehyde, which isn't great. So obviously in the built environment, we always need to be very careful what we do because looking in the past um, what had happened is people thought asbestos was the best for fire safety as a great material for fire safety reasons but now we are wiser and we build a lot of asbestos into our buildings but later turns out for health reasons is actually not great um, so that's always one one consideration that that you have to do when you consider all these things so that's why we're trying to understand it better and then we can go to our friends in in the timber industry and colleagues uh, maybe in the adhesive manufacturer or in uh, people who produce composite materials and we can try to weigh off these options. So this one has better fire safety. Um, this one is cheaper. Um, where, do, where do we find a, 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 an optimum product that um, is as safe as feasible? Um, on, uh, so a very interesting answer, but in terms of, I guess, uh, product development, and you just mentioned uh, there's obviously a lot of research trying to detect and characterize some of these phenomena to help inform that. Um, do you see products which, which actually have some censoring capability or, or more sophisticated evaluations of building performance under fires uh, that perhaps allow either, either research insights or, or a fire safety response that's more data driven? Uh, I mean, not in terms of products that are produced. I know it's getting like a bigger thing now to put sensors in buildings when, especially for timber buildings, that's an active field of research. But usually these are, for example, moisture sensors or sensors that track the movement of buildings. But in terms of fire safety, there isn't, that not, there isn't actively, I think, uh, a building product that builds and things for, for sensors. I mean, Mostly in fire safety, the sensors we use are, are heat or smoke detectors, which are basically to alert people about the, um, about the fire being happening so they can escape. But then once it's beyond that, um, there aren't that many products that, that do things. I mean, one thing you can do is when you, when you produce your CLT, you can, you can put thermocouples in the glue lines when you press it. But then some research in the past has shown that that actually then leads to earlier fall off so by having the thermocouple in your sample, you're actually affecting the very thing you want to measure. So it's, it's again, a tricky balance. Um, and it's one of the things that goes in the category, how the sausage is made. It's one of those decisions you have to make when you, when you design your experiment. Um, can you, will your measurement influence your outcome and by how much and can you control for that? But in terms, to go back to your original question, in terms of building products, I'm not aware of anything that has built in sensors for fire safety specifically. Well, your answer actually that Felix is perfect because it, it, it leads to the next question. So instrumentation itself could obviously affect the outcome or, or your understanding of the phenomena is being studied. But um, apart from thermocouples, are there non-contact or other measurement techniques that fire safety groups are using routinely as part of their investigations? 
uh, you can use uh, infrared cameras, which can show you basically the sort of radiation on, and heat temperature. You can measure the temperature of a camera, but the problem is they're very expensive. And the good thing about thermocouples is they're relatively cheap. So you don't mind that much when they get destroyed. And usually when you put them from behind in timber um, or from the side and you can keep them away from the fire, you can reuse them. But with a camera, it gets tricky because you don't want to buy a, a 10 or $20,000 thermal camera and then put, the, put it in a fire. Um, there is uh, at NIST, uh, the National Institutes of uh, Safety and Technology or Safety and Stand Standards and Technology in the US. Uh, they have they came up with this cool way of getting basically a GoPro or a camera uh, that's waterproof and putting it in a in a bowl or in a sphere, and they keep running water through that, and that way it cools, and that way they can look into a building fire, or they have also used it for wildfires, which helps you to visualize things. It doesn't give you direct temperature measurements, but it helps you to see what's going on. Um, we have also sort of copied their approach and we have been doing it for our large scale experiments um, on a bit of less sophisticated approach, basically just a GoPro and a beaker. Um, and what we found is it's very interesting, but in terms of data, it's hard to interpret because while the fire is going on, you see a lot of flames, but if the flame is thick enough, um, you, you don't really see beyond it. Um, yeah, so it's it's tricky. It's, it's I mean, I wish there was a magic sensor that you place somewhere that, that has uh, just a remote connection because that would really help us not to have to connect all these wires. Um, because if you think if you think one thermocouple is just one wire, but in a large scale experiment, you will you will use up to 500 thermocouples, and that means you have to connect 500 wires to a computer somewhere. So you always end up with this with this mess of, of cables that, that will eventually drive you crazy. So yeah, um, if anyone has a good idea for for a remote sensor that doesn't rely on cables and is non-intrusive, that would be we would be very interested in that. Well, that sounds like a good challenge for the um, audience there, Felix. I've got one final question here for you. Actually, asked from two different uh, people. Um, you've, you've spoken uh, about a broad range of topics, but one thing you didn't delve into is uh, surface treatments or fire retardants, what people are doing actually to slow or prevent uh, wood burn from an, an external or treatment perspective. Yeah, so um, fire retardants are a way to help timber be more, um, to perform better in fire. Um, it's one thing we, 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 are, we are actually going to look into in this research group. It's one of the research topics um, I'm going to go into or I'm going into. Um, one thing with fire retardants is they, most of them act by preventing ignition um, or delaying ignition, but they cannot make timber fire safe completely. So there's a limit. So they can, they can slow down the growth of your fire. And, but then after that, once the fire is developed, they don't add that much. So they're more an ignition prevention. Um, they're interesting for exterior fires. Um, for example, um, when you talk about bushfires and you have a nice timber deck and you don't want that to burn down, um, fire retardants are a potential thing you can look into there. Um, but one thing with exterior products is that if they're outside and they're outside for 20, 30, 40 years, you're going to get what we call leaching. So the fire retardant is slowly going to leach out of your product. Um, so you need to find a fire retardant that's really like bound into your product. So that's ongoing research. Um, another thing we're doing, we're looking at the combination of fire retardants and durability, because a lot of timbers that we want to use outdoors, like I mentioned electricity poles before, um, obviously we, want to, we don't want to replace them every few years. Um, so they're affected by durability issues, which could be termites, it could be fungi, and you can use a treatment to prevent fungi and termites, but some of these treatments actually reduce the fire performance. And obviously what we're looking for, which would be the silver bullet, um, would be to find a treatment that satisfies both fire safety and durability, or at least one that doesn't make the other thing worse. So, which is, again, what I talked about earlier, it's always a fine balance to strike and compromises. And research in that is going on. And one thing we're also looking into is how can we use fire retardants better than just using them on the surface? Um, obviously, I talked about different timber species of uh, timber species like this, where iron bark is harder to treat because it's more dense. 
So it's harder to actually get fire retardant in here than, than in a different. So the Queensland maple, this is probably hard to see, but you can see all these pores. There's a lower density. So it's, it's more, um, I mean, we haven't actually matched the permeable, but just from the looks of it, it's more, it looks more permeable. So I would imagine it's easier to get fire retardant in there than in a different timber species. Um, and that's another thing you have to consider is your combination of species that you can actually treat. And then if you really want to go deeper, there's also a difference between your, your hardwood and your sapwood. Um, those two don't treat equally likely. So one of them is going to be when you put durability or fire retardant treatment in, one of them is going to have less protection. So then you need to know what you actually have in your product of those two. Fantastic. Um, well, Felix, I think uh, I can speak on behalf of the audience and say thank you for a fantastic tour and, and very interesting Q&A. Uh, we appreciate your time. Kyle, I'll throw it back to you. Thank you, everyone, too, for uh, the great questions. Thanks, Joe, and, uh, and a big thanks to everyone for joining us today. Um, we hope you found today's session interesting and have been able to take away some practical information. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, this webinar is the final session in our Leaders of Influence webinar series for 2020. We have delivered a number of great sessions um, this year featuring leading researchers, industry and, uh, and alumni presented by our schools of civil engineering, chemical engineering, information technology and electrical engineering and mechanical and mining engineering. And we hope you've all enjoyed them. Uh, we will continue to run these webinars in 2021 using this online format. So keep an eye on the website, for more interesting and engaging sessions to be announced. The web address is on your screens at the moment. Uh, and make sure you start to date with the latest news and opportunities connect, to connect via our social media pages and website. Um, and if you have any further questions about Felix's work or would like to discuss any opportunities to work with us, we'll be sending out a follow-up email in the coming days, which will have our contact details included. Uh, and that's it. So thanks again for participating, everyone. Stay safe. And we look forward to hosting you at an alumni and industry event again soon. Thank you.